So for those of you who are new to us, Students for Shelters is a recognized student group operating on the U of T St. George campus. We are recognized through ULife and the U of T Student Union. The mission of our group is to encourage the school community to take local action to donate smaller items to shelters that are not always thought of, such as socks and feminine hygiene products. We want to donate these items to local organizations in support of the less fortunate. We also strive to participate in other forms of action to raise awareness and act in solidarity with those in need. Our community unites students from diverse backgrounds and brings them together under one common objective, helping others. In turn, we are hoping to create a lasting impact on students and others' lives in a positive way. My name is Brianna and my pronouns are she, her. I am a co-founder and co-president of Students for Shelters. Illuminate is a series of panels occurring this semester. This is our second of three and we hope to see you at the rest. As the theme of this panel is, access, is homelessness, we hope to have another coming up in November which will focus on food and nutrition. I hope you all will be interested in returning. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Frances, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the vice president of Students for Shelters, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. I can't believe that it is our second panel already. Feels like the semester is flying by and we're heading very deep into winter. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to our executive team and our guests here today, Homes First and Covenant House. I'm really excited to see how the discussion goes this evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Hannah and my pronouns are she and her. And I'm also one of the co-founders and co-presidents of Students for Shelters. And I'm so glad that you're all here to join us this evening. And I'm so glad to see many familiar names on the side over here in our participants. Uh, tonight, I will be moderating the conversation between these two wonderful organizations. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for this evening and give you a slight background on the organizations which they represent. And I'll begin with Covenant House. Covenant House focuses on young people who have experiences with homelessness and sex trafficking. In the last fiscal year alone, Covenant House provided 350 youth with support each day. And here with us from Covenant House, we have Nicole. Nicole has always been passionate about working with and supporting organizations that aim to empower young people. Naturally, Covenant House was a perfect fit. She has been on the Covenant House uh, development team for almost two years now. Starting in major gifts fundraising, she soon found her way into events. Currently, she works with all third party events and helps to plan Covenant House's four annual signature events. Thank you so much, Nicole, for being here with us tonight. And now I'll introduce you to Homes First. Homes First has been working for over 35 years to provide supportive housing and currently operates housing programs and shelters all throughout the Toronto area. And from Homes First with us tonight, we have Ryan. And Ryan has been involved in the nonprofit se sector from a young age. He is a graduate of the Children's Media Program at Centennial College and specialized in community and youth engagement. Ryan has worked for Homes First for three years. He started at Homes First as the volunteer coordinator and has since been the relief supervisor, community engagement coordinator, and is currently in his role as the community engagement supervisor. Thank you so much, Ryan, for being here tonight. And a journalism graduate from Ryerson, Hanya has started with Homes First as a volunteer before joining the organization as the Community Development Coordinator in 2017. Three years later, she is now the Supervisor of Communications and Marketing and works closely with her colleagues to bring awareness to Homes First's mission and the people they serve. Her favorite part about the role is learning about the clients and their journeys. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you all of you for being here this evening. And I'll get started with some introductory questions for both organizations. And first, I'd like to ask, would you mind elaborating on your organization's mission and your role in the organization? Nicole, would you like to start? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Ryan. Um, no so I'm Nicole. Uh, I am, as mentioned, the events, one of the event coordinators at Covenant House. So I've been with Covenant House for almost two years now. I started in major gift fundraising. So a major gift at Covenant House is about $10,000 plus. And now I'm working in events. So I'm supporting all our third party and school groups that are doing fundraisers for us. And 
as an organization, uh, as any charity, their, their donors are super important. And especially for us, um, almost 80% of our annual operating budget is actually donor funded. Uh, so we really appreciate just like the hard work and the dedication of our donor base. Um, they're really, really great. And also we get so many passionate students like you guys. And so it's really wonderful to see that. So thank you for having us and I'm really excited for tonight. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Covenant House, we're actually located in the center of downtown Toronto. We're about a five minute walk from the Eaton Center. And we're actually Canada's largest agency supporting youth who are homeless trafficked or at risk. And we serve about 300 youth a day. And we're able to do this through the support and generosity of our donors in the community, but also um, our hardworking staff who work around the clock to make sure that we're there for our youth, we're able to, able to provide these services, and we're offering the widest range of 24-7 services. So with these services and programs, we're really trying to help youth gain those independent skills, ignite their potential, and be able to succeed in the future. Um, so Homes First, uh, Homes First is a nonprofit organization. We provide uh, shelter and support to over 1,200 people every night. Um, Homes First takes pride in housing those that are the, the hardest to house. So those that have spent uh, many years experiencing homelessness, who live with complex mental health and substance use challenges, uh, and for those who uh, can find uh, regular housing uh, is uh, somewhat hard to maintain. So uh, by offering support services, um, we're able to find our uh, residents uh, appropriate housing to break the cycle of homelessness. Uh, in total, we have nine emergency shelters and 13 supportive housing properties, or we call them rent geared to income properties. Um, and they're located downtown Toronto, some North York, and in Scarborough as well. We have three locations at the moment. So, so uh, yeah. Anya, feel free to, if I missed anything. I'll, I'll jump in if I feel like I need to, but you okay, got that great. good. So. <laughs> Thank you. And my next question again for uh, both organizations, what does working in this field in Toronto look like? And what are some of the greatest misconceptions people have about homelessness? Um, I'll start if you don't mind, Nicole. Um, so the social services and the shelter system in Toronto is really diverse in terms of the people that you're serving, but also the people that you're working with. Um, so, you know, in a typical shelter, you'll have everyone from nurses to personal support workers, PSWs, um, to frontline shelter workers, to the cooks who are feeding people, to volunteers, um, and it could be students like yourselves, it could be uh, someone who, um, you know, is trained in counseling, it could be a yoga instructor. Um, it's pretty widespread. And then even, you know, Ryan and I come from the administration team but we're all you know we have really different backgrounds um, and I'm someone who had absolutely no social services you know experience before coming to work for a shelter provider um, so it's really interesting to see kind of you know how many people it takes and what a, a wide net that we you know cast to, to get the talent that we need to, to do the work that we do I also just to add, I also think another big misconception is about those experiencing homelessness uh, is that they, they choose to be there. Uh, no one wants to lose their home. There, there are many, there's multiple factors, events that result in somebody experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, we have a, a poster in one of our locations that's Strawn House that says um, many people are one paycheck away from being homelessness. So there's a, a wide variety of walks of life um, that end up in the shelter system and, and low income housing. Um, so there's, you know, life can, no matter who you are, can throw you curveballs. So that's another kind of misconception that I'm sure a lot of people experience in, in homeless sector. Yeah, and I would absolutely echo um, both sentiments. And I think something else that we experience too, and especially because we're working with young people, a lot of people, they want to assume or they think, oh, young people, they're all criminals, or they're probably doing crimes, or they're graffitiing, or, you know, in gangs, or those sorts of things, when really, that might be the case for a young person, but that's not the majority. And they're just like you or I, and they're pretty, you know, their day to days aren't very different than our own. And they're just looking for stable housing and have been given a bad, you know, draw at in certain situations. And so this idea that, you know, if you're young and homeless, you're automatically a criminal or you've done something wrong is a, is a misconception we see a lot and definitely is not true. Thank you so much for that insight. Yeah. 
Um, so the next few questions are going to be geared more towards Covenant House. Please, uh, Ryan and Hanya, feel free to chip in if, if you have anything to add. Um, so Nicole, sex trafficking is a growing issue in Canada. What are common misunderstandings people have concerning sex trafficking and how can people be more aware? Yeah, great question. So as you mentioned, sex trafficking is growing and it's growing really quickly. And part of that is also because um, we haven't had the language to talk about it before. And now um, we do and we're able to have those conversations and discuss what, with people is what is going on and what sex trafficking is. So because it's pretty misunderstood, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions that surround sex trafficking. And I can um, I can speak to three uh, just for right now because there are so many, but I think the first one would have to be that, you know, sex traf trafficking is not our issue. It's an overseas issue. It's not happening in our community when in fact that's almost completely false. And we've been working in the community for almost 40 years supporting victims of sex trafficking. And recently our research and statistics have shown that 93% of victims are Canadian. So that's, that's a huge percentage. That's almost 100%. So it absolutely is an at-home issue. It's happening in our communities. It's happening to our, um, our young people. And no one is, it can happen to anyone, essentially. Um, so that's a really big myth that we see. A second one would be that all traffickers are men. And while often that can be the case, that's not entirely true. And it is possible to be trafficked by women and trafficking is a very complex issue and the way in which a victim is trafficked, uh, there's a lot of layers and there's a lot of things that go into it. It's not just, I mean, someone could be kidnapped, but that's not the average way someone is trafficked. And about 30% of victims are trafficked by somebody that they would refer to as their boyfriend. And 25% of victims are trafficked by a friend and usually that friend is a victim themselves. So that's another misconception. And then a third myth or misconception that we get uh, often is victims are always physically detained. And again, that's a possibility. It could absolutely happen, but traffickers don't always and mostly don't have to physically detain their victim because they've manipulated them in other ways. And usually that tends to be through psychological, emotional, and financial manipulation so that their victims are then dependent on them. And so they don't, you don't have to physically detain someone that you've emotionally manipulated because you know they're going to keep coming back to you. So I guess those would be uh, some of the more common myths. And because again, sex trafficking, it's growing and there's a lot of cases and we're finally having these discussions more often. It's really important, as you said, for people to be aware. And recently we, were, we launched um, a resource on our website called Traffic Stop. So if you go to covenanthousetoronto.ca, there's a button, I believe it's in the top right corner, it says Traffic Stop. And this is a resource sharing center. And we created it to educate people. And it's, it has really, really good resources. Uh, I would totally recommend just clicking through it. We have things for parents and caregivers and educators to speak to their students or teachers or their young ones about sex trafficking in a age appropriate way. We have things for other social services. And the neat thing about Traffic Stop is it was built with working with about or over 200 victims of sex trafficking. So these resources are coming firsthand and it's, uh, education and tools that we've built over time in order to best equip the community with understanding this really big issue. Thank you so much for that very in-depth and detailed answer. That sounds like a great, great resource to have and use. I'll go to the next question, which is Covenant House's website discusses the importance of using public policy to create long-term changes in the lives of homeless youth and those at risk of sex trafficking. What are some of the most notable policy changes that have been recently made or you believe uh, should be changed? Yeah, so obviously we are giving direct services to youth and that's a big part of what we do, but we're also really involved in advocacy and influencing public policy. And one of the more recent wins we had was uh, actually in May of 2019, we worked with the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking to institute a national 
hotline for victims of sex trafficking because prior to May of 2019, we were the only country in North America that did not have a hotline for victims of sex trafficking. So with, in partnership with the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking, we delivered to the Prime Minister a national petition signed by more than 18,000 people. We were successful in May of 2019 that launched and that's launched through the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking. And uh, we've helped promote it and helped with media and it's been, I think, a really big win, win for us. And it was really great that we were able to get that started. And then we have had other wins in influencing public policy and all of that, those um, wins are listed on our website. And if you're interested, you can go to our advocacy page and we kind of lay out the other policies that we've worked towards. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, homelessness and sex trafficking has no boundaries and definitely extends beyond the city of Toronto. What steps has uh, Covenant House Toronto taken to partner with other jurisdictions across the GTA to address this issue? And do you share best practices and research with other communities to help build capacity and vice versa? Yeah, for sure. And that's to reference what I was just talking about, traffic stop. That's part of a big reason why we built it was to share best practices and to share research and to share what we've come to learn for other social service, social services. Um, so it's really great that way. It's also really good for industry as well. So for example, hotels and teaching them what signs of trafficking might look like in a hotel. And to continue on with that same thought, we also do in school and in industry presentations. So we reach about 30,000 students each year going into schools talking about homelessness, runaway prevention, and anti-sex trafficking. And I think these are really effective presentations because a lot of young people, it might be happening to them and they don't understand that that's what happen what's happening. Or maybe that they see that, that the, those signs are happening to a friend and they're kind of able to put words to what's going on. So it's been really effective in educating uh, young people and people who have friends or might think that that's what's happening to them. And then as mentioned, we're also going into hotels and teaching them that these could be the signs of someone who's being trafficking. And if you think that someone is being trafficked, this is what you should do. So we're all about, you know, consulting other agencies, working with other agencies and really educating and trying to get this issue, you know, known and people talking about and trying to resolve it. That, that truly is amazing because resources and spreading these resources and these in this information does play a big role, definitely, especially in places like hotels or schools where you do find a lot of uh, young people in the schools. I'll now move on to the topic of healthcare and physical health, where I'll have questions for both organizations again. But first, just one last question uh, directed towards Covenant House. So Covenant House has four principles for approaching health, stabilize, engage, transition, connect. Would you mind describing what each of these points entail and why they are important? Yeah, of course. So at Covenant House, before anything, we believe in serving the immediate needs of a young person. And we approach a young person in a holistic manner. So mind, body, and spirit. And so we're gonna approach um, just as we would give them food, we, we want to make sure that their immediate needs are met. And that includes food, shelter, and how, uh, food, shelter, and clothing. And once these immediate needs are met, we can then continue on with what they need at that time. And we do that through, as you mentioned, stabilize, engage, and transition. So that stabilizing is addressing their immediate needs because they can't think about what they what their goals are, what their future is, if they're in a state of survival and they, you know, they're hungry or they're fearing for their safety. So we, we aim to stabilize right away. And then through that, we're able to engage with them and they're able to engage with our staff and kind of discuss maybe why they're there or what it is that they're hoping to get from us or, or maybe they're just hoping to engage in a certain program like seeing an employment counselor or getting um, a checkup at our healthcare clinic. And then as they engage in our programs, we want to equip them with skills and training and independence that they need in order to finish school if that's what they want or find stable housing 
And so we're supporting them through that transition, whatever it is that they've decided they want. And then lastly, through that transition, they're able to connect with the community, but knowing that we're also always there that for them to connect with and that they can rely on us, even if they're out in a house in the community or if they're living with us currently. Amazing, thank you. And now this, uh, we're gonna open the floor to both organizations. How does your form of support and care provision differ when individuals come in looking for immediate action versus when they are seeking a more long-term assistance relationship with the organization and its staff? Um, so Homes First does multiple things. Uh, we operate supportive housing. So that's for long-term residents of Homes First. They pay rent and have all the rights under the Landlord and Tenant Acts and have assigned uh, workers, uh, intensive uh, case management workers to support them. Uh, then we operate traditional shelters and, and respites as well. Uh, so where people can come in for a night or two or stay longer as really as long as they want and we have staff there that will work with them uh, on anything they need. It could be um, getting an ID, applying for financial support, submitting applications to find housing, uh, just connecting with social services. Uh, our shelters have specialized teams called uh, ICM, uh, intensive case management teams who work with residents on long term goals as well as you know, frontline community shelter workers who do kind of the day-to-day -day support and the immediate needs uh, for shelters and the respite uh, residents. Thank you, Ryan. Nicole, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, sure. So we, I guess, kind of as I mentioned before, uh, anyone who comes to Covenant House will receive immediate care and we are addressing their immediate needs. And anyone who comes to Covenant House as soon as they, so they would come to Covenant House and they go through an intake process and any youth that's come to us for services or programs is assigned a youth worker. So once those immediate needs are net, met, they're able to work with their youth worker on a youth led um, individualized program, I guess, uh, for what they want to achieve. And that's gonna look different depending on the youth. So we understand that some youth are coming to us further along in their journey than others. So for some youth, it could just be getting that stability of you know, three meals a day because they've been on the street for a couple weeks. For some youth, it might be that they had to drop out of high school to help their parents you know, pay for rent and they just need a couple extra credits at, at school. And so they're good, they wanna take them at our onsite high school. So because every youth is on a different journey, we have multiple solutions that could work and cater to their journey. And those solutions would be, as I was mentioning, it could be our crisis shelter, it could be booking an appointment at our healthcare clinic or using the services in our drop-in center or just taking a course at our school. So that's kind of how we're addressing youth's immediate need, needs versus their long-term needs. And just to uh, build off that question, how does the provision of support differ now during the COVID pandemic era? Are there more precautions and hoops that must be jumped through in order to reach the same level of support that was being reached, let's say a year ago? Um, I'll jump in if you guys don't mind. Uh, so yeah, COVID-19 has brought a lot of changes um, to the shelter system across Toronto, um, but we're still doing the same work that we're doing. So, you know, despite COVID, we're still actively working with all of our residents on their short-term goals, on their long-term goals, on providing the same sort of shelter services that we would be providing before COVID. Um, we've definitely had to do some rearranging in our shelters to enable physical distancing. And so because of that, we've actually opened two new hotel programs. Um, so we're still serving clients there and supporting them. Um, but of, of course, everyone's got like, you know, their own physical room. Um, and then of course, there's all the increased like safety measures and screening tools and, you know, cleaning that we do to just make sure everyone's safe on site. Um, but if anything, our services obviously haven't stopped during COVID, but if anything, it's more important now than ever to get people appropriate stable housing um, so that they can, you know, stay safe. The government keeps saying, telling people stay home, stay safe, but you can't do that if you're living in a shelter, right? Or if you're living on the street. So more than ever, um, housing is so important. And from a community engagement and programming standpoint or point of view, um, <clears throat> 
excuse me, some of a lot of our like volunteer and, and placement commitments had to be put on hold, unfortunately, or, or temporarily paused. You know, we had a lot of events and different things that we were planning that had to be put on hiatus. Things like the Pride Festival that we participate in, participate in every year, summer barbecues, things like that. Um, but yeah, like, like Hanya was saying, a lot of the internal supports really are still business as usual, just a little bit more strict in terms of uh, health precautions and, and safety precautions. Yeah, I think Covenant House has echoed almost the exact same thing. We also had, with the help of the City of Toronto, we had our crisis shelter runs at a 96 bed occupancy and we had to move 38 of our youth into hotels and we're also working with and supporting youth from the YMCA Turning Point Youth Services and EVAs. So uh, a lot of close partnerships there and just increasing the cleaning that's happening in the house, um, still providing those services, but some of them have been tweaked a little bit. So um, while we still have that 96 bed shelter, some youth are gonna be in the hotel, some will be on site. We still run our on-site transitional housing. Um, we have four specialized housing in the community, two for victims of sex trafficking, one for racialized minority and one for um, members of the LGBTQ plus community. And so they're still um, living in their homes, but practicing social distancing and maybe they've reduced the number of, you know, social dinners and people have to, and you know, that's because they live there, that's their bubble. So there's not so much concern there. Um, and then, you know, staff or staff and youth are screened before coming in, all staff wear masks and just following whatever uh, updates and guidelines we get from the city and implementing it so that we can provide those services, but keep our youth and our staff safe. Great, thank you all. Um, the Ontario government has recently changed testing for COVID-19 such that you must book an appointment for the test. And as of October 7th, 2020, the health minister proposed mobile testing to reach those who are unable to book an appointment. Has moving toward appointment only testing impacted homeless individuals and those without access to the technology to book an appointment? I can start if you want. Um, so at Homes First, uh, we continue to do daily screening on site for all residents, all staff um, every day. Uh, and it's using the Toronto Public Health uh, screening tool that they provide. It also includes uh, taking somebody's temperature. Um, and we have policies and pr procedures in place to safely book and transport um, anybody if they do show any symptoms. Um, so if an appointment ever needs to be booked for clients, we have ICM and frontline staff available 24-7 to, to assist or call or uh, book online if needed or anything like that. Yes, and Covenant House, we're very fortunate because we've been working very closely with Toronto Public Health and the St. Michael's Hospital COVID-19 Assessment Centre, and we've actually been able to conduct on-site COVID-19 testing for both youth and staff alike. So we're really fortunate that way, and they're continuing to work with us and um, allow us that courtesy. And so we're really grateful just for the support of Toronto Public Health and St. Mike's. That's great, thank you for sharing. Um, one more question related to physical health for, um, for all of you. Um, mostly for Homes First. September was Hunger Action Month in Toronto, and over the course of COVID-19, many individuals and families have experienced food insecurity. Does this affect shelters and food banks, and what is being done to address this surge? Uh, yeah, so Homes First actually just did a blog post about Hunger Action Month uh, you know, maybe two weeks ago. So you guys can definitely visit our website to check that out. Um, so we're very lucky. All of our shelters do provide three meals a day plus snacks, though that's kind of just written into the budget. Um, however, our housing sites are a little different and to support our clients there, we used to host community meals um, where people would get together and, you know, share a meal, maybe watch, uh, do some bingo, watch a movie. And unfortunately, uh, due to physical distancing and um, or the lack thereof, we had to cancel our community meals because um, we just couldn't believe that we could keep you know everyone safely apart during that um so for people who might be living on lower incomes and for some of our clients that is the case they're on ow or odsp um and people who are relying on community meals or food banks this has definitely been a huge impact um i think the stat is that you know food bank um visits have gone up 300 percent 
and 75% of people um, who are using food banks or, or something like that are using it for the first time because of the pandemic. Um, so we're really lucky uh, to have continued par partnerships with Second Harvest who are still coming by to support us, uh, neighbors who are still coming by to support us. Um, and, you know, we're receiving food donations from um, restaurants and, and, and a whole bunch of other organizations to, to support us. But it's definitely, um, you know, we've seen the impact that it's happened because, you know, we ourselves can't see our, our residents in the same way. You know, everyone's pretty isolated, which is unfortunate, um, but we're still lucky to, to be able to support them in other ways. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you all for that great conversation about physical health. We're just going to take a um, now a little bit of a turn and talk about uh, healthcare once again, but in terms of mental health. And specifically, this question is for Homes First. Homes First works to help many individuals fighting addiction and mental health issues. One of the ways you address this is through harm reduction programs. So my first question regarding this is, what are common misconceptions about harm reduction programs? Yeah, um, so the whole idea around harm reduction isn't to get a person to give up their addiction and stop using the substance that they're using. Um, addictions are mental health issues first and foremost so it's really unrealistic to just expect a person to go cold turkey and give something up when that's something that they're using has quite literally rewired their brain to be extremely dependent on it um so any resident who comes to us who does want to stop using we're totally supportive of that and we can get them all the supports that they need but harm reduction is really focused on using safely. Um, so for that, for us, that means, you know, providing safe, clean supplies, um, encouraging people to use together. Um, all of our staff are trained in how to administer naloxone and are trained in overdose response. Um, so thank, thankfully for that, you know, our client or our residents, sorry, our staff have actually saved lives. Um, but, you know, the idea that harm reduction programs actually uh, promote use isn't I don't think, you know, isn't really realistic. It's really more about, you know, if you're going to use, use in the safest way possible so that, you know, you don't end up losing a life. Excellent. Thank you. And what are the benefits of harm reduction? I know you slightly touched upon them, but if you could just go over them once again. Yeah, it's really, yeah, at the end of the day, it's really just about using safely, um, you know, with, you know, clean needles, you're, you know, preventing the risk of, you know, spreading uh, different infections, um, you know, with using with other people, you're, you know, you know, lessening the risk of an overdose because you have someone there to watch you. Um, with all our staff and our naloxone training, it's the same thing. You know, if anything does happen, our staff know what to do and how to do it in a timely manner to actually save lives. And, and our residents know it as well. We've had an instance where residents see someone and they recognize that this is an overdose and they go and they get staff and they do it just in time to save that person's life. Um, so it is really all, you know, an overall effort with everyone in our shelters. Um, and we're really lucky to, to have have that supportive environment to work in. And just to build on what Hani was saying, like a big part of it is like she said, is building education and awareness and, and responses and opening communication amongst everyone. So people are able to respond if they need it in, a, in an emergency. But a part of it also is reducing stigmas too around, um, you know, use and safe use and, and drug use in general. And, and how Hanya was saying it, it is a mental health challenge and it is related. Um, so it's, it's breaking down those barriers as well and just opening up that conversation that I think is uh, a big benefit of, of harm reduction. Wonderful, thank you so much. We're gonna move on to the topic of education. And this question is open to both Covenant House and Homes First. With schooling shifting to a largely virtual and online delivery, how is your organization aiming to provide support to homeless youth struggling to keep up with or engage in this type of learning due to a lack of access to resources or knowledge surrounding the use of such softwares and technologies? Okay, uh, I can take that to start. So at Covenant House, we have an on-site high school and it operates more as a transitional high school. So it's not your standard, you know, show up at eight or nine and you're done at three and you're in class all day and you sit in a room with 30 other kids and you have different teachers. Um, it's It operates on an ongoing intake basis and it's individualized programming. Because uh, again, we understand that these youth are 
are coming from all different um, backgrounds and journeys. And maybe some of them are working half the day or maybe um, they have appointments or are in another program in the shelter. So um, we're kind of building out that like individual learning plan for them. And so we have uh, an eight, a capacity of eight students at a time. And generally speaking, it's not really a school where the point isn't for them to stay in our high school. It's usually used if they need a credit or two to graduate, then it's a good way to get that credit or two. Or maybe they had to drop out of high school and they're 17 and they're at a grade nine level. We can help get them those credits to then integrate back into their feeder school so that they're able to be at that, um, at that learning level with their peers. So um, with COVID, it really put into perspective online schooling and the difficulties around technology. So maybe it's a lack of um, resources such as a laptop or an iPad or not being able to have Wi-Fi. So we really landed that on the, <clears throat> on the solution that school has to happen in person for us. And so in order to do that, we've basically been working with the Toronto Catholic District School Board and we're following all the implementations that they're doing in their other schools. So we've, uh, we're always cleaning uh, Zulma, who is our education support worker. She makes sure that after the youth leave at the end of the day or at the end of their you know, learning session, she wipes down um, their workspace, their keyboards, their mouses. Um, they have individualized learning kits. So if they need notebooks and pens and pencils, they all have their own kit that's labeled. And then that way, um, it helps with organization. So um, there's less, you know, cross contamination. And then we also have put in plexiglasses. So in their workstation or their desk that you have those plexiglasses dividing people. Um, what's neat is that we find uh, food is a really good way to bond with our young people. And a lot of our young people have been in a situation where they haven't had food. So we always have it available to them. So uh, Pre-COVID and during COVID, we still offer uh, breakfast and lunch at, in our school. It's just that all the items are individually wrapped. And then they have the option to, well, if they have uh, the resources to, you know, take work home with them. So if they have a laptop or an iPad, they have that option. They can learn from home. And we're working with the Toronto Catholic District School Board to acquire some uh Chromebooks so that should we go into full lockdown again, they're still able to continue their learning virtually. Um, just to echo some of that, um, um, we Homes First doesn't really serve. We we do have some youth in in our uh, two of our housing locations, two or three of our housing locations, but uh, we don't have uh, schooling. But we do we have been able to adapt some of our in person programming to a virtual setting. So, um, you know, our relationship coaching and job readiness. Uh, we've had some financial workshops. We have a yoga class we do that's virtual. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a barrier when it comes to access around Wi Fi and just smart devices in general. Um, um, you know, uh, to, to adapt for these virtual uh, social services, connecting people with, with social workers or mental health supports virtually. Um, you know, we are looking into getting more laptops and setting up sort of some computer areas for people. And some of our shelters do have computer labs available, which we're fortunate to have. But yeah, not everyone has a smart device and, you know, some of the Wi-Fi connections aren't great. And so it, it is a barrier. And so just trying to bridge that gap and create better access and get more access to technology for our residents is, is an ongoing challenge that we kind of have to adapt to um, going forward. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and say that, um, you know, for seniors, COVID has been a lot because, you know, a lot of them socialize physically. They don't do, you know, Zoom meetings as much or, or stuff like that. So all of a sudden they can't, you know, go to the community center and like, you know, this is stereotypical, but like do their bingo or their aqua fitness class or whatever it is that they do. So, you know, we're now trying to find ways of like, how can we, you know, bring technology to the seniors living with us and provide them options for, you know, virtual connection because now more than ever, um, you know, you, you really feel like you need a support and you need a friend. And for a lot of our, you know, senior residents, they don't have phones or they just, technology is not their thing. But also when you're living with a mental health issue, which a lot of our residents are, which all of our residents are, um, being isolated becomes so much harder. Um, so I think we're, we're realizing how important technology is, but also um, how much of a barrier it can be to a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. Technology has 
and always been a big barrier and has become even greater of a barrier now, especially during these times right now. Um, we'll now move on to the topic of housing. And this question is again open to both organizations. So both Homes First and Covenant House provide shelters for the homeless in Toronto and the GTA. Is this a pit stop of a long journey or is this a final destination? How do both organizations ensure that the people with the privilege to have these resources are not abusing the shelter system? Um, I'll go first if you don't mind, Nicole. Um, so at Homes First, the goal is always affordable, appropriate housing for everybody we serve. Um, you know, uh, the names Homes First really means that with Housing First, people can work on any other issues that they might be facing. Um, that being said, you know, you can't force anyone into housing. Housing is really difficult to find in Toronto, and that becomes even more difficult um, when you're dealing with a mental health or addiction issue. Um, and you can't really stop someone from using the shelter system either, right, if they don't want to go into housing. So everyone has their own needs for being in the shelter system, whether they're there for two weeks, whether they're there for three months, whether they're, they're there for nine years. And they're, you know, there are people who have been in the shelter for shelter system for years and years and years, um, and they're used to it, and that what they that's how they feel at home. Um, so the best that we can do for all of our residents is just to try to understand their journey um, and identify what their needs are, and then work with them to get them the supports that they want and that they need, so that they can make the choice on how to stabilize and move forward in their lives. Yeah, I think I would I would echo a lot of that as well, and that you know affordable housing is a really it's really tough in Toronto, and housing with these clients is really complex, and there's a lot of layers. and And as I've mentioned before, we know that our youth are coming to us um, all with different journeys. So whether they're staying in our crisis shelter or they're in one of our community apartments or in traditional houses, we know that a youth's time with us could be from one night to years while they work through our programs. And so our goal is really just to equip them with those skills and the confidence and the stability that they need in order to thrive on their own. And so we understand that a shelter is not an ideal place to live. And if given the opportunity, I think a lot of people would not want to live in a shelter. And, and really the lack of affordable housing is keeping our young people in this shelter system longer than they probably would have hoped. And Again, that's something that shelter systems can't control. We, we rally and can lobby for affordable housing, but we can't actually implement that. So really what we're trying to do as an organization is just to expand our housing op options that we can offer our young people. And, and it's really great because right now we're, over to we're able to provide over 700 youth through our various housing programs. And our goal is just to continue to help those young people transition to independence, but also keep their housing and give them the tools so that, you know, in three months or a year, they don't lose that housing. Um, for anyone who wants to know more, in 2018, the City of Toronto did a street needs assessment, and it's, you know, a pretty long document, but it really breaks down kind of... Um, you know, how many people in the shelter system, you know, what's their age? Are they living with a mental health issue? And one of the stats that they pulled from this report was that 96% of people interviewed in this report um, who are living in shelters or living on the street want housing, but there's just so many barriers to getting it. Um, so if anyone wants to take like a deeper dive into kind of what the shelter system looks like, that's a pretty great report to read. Great, thank you for sharing that resource as well, Hania. Um, now this question is directed towards Homes First. With constant changes in the Toronto and GTA housing market, so for example, prices and availability, which we've touched upon slightly, how quickly is your organization able to adapt to these changes? Or are there any adaptations that need to be made at all? Additionally, could you give some examples of any changes you have made to mold yourselves around the ever-changing needs of the GTA community? Yeah, so, um, of course, you know, when you're already living in such a, a tough housing market, such as Toronto, and you're living with a severe mental health addiction, uh, sometimes it affects your work, you're living on a limited income in a city where, you know, one bedroom costs 2000 or more. Um, at Homes First, we operate a rent geared to income model, uh, which means our housing and residents pay no more than 30% of their monthly income to rent. 
So, um, you know, it's, it's deeply affordive housing. So there's, there's also subsidies available that support them. But at the end of the day, what we really need is, is deeply affordable, but also supportive housing. So um, being able to, you know, afford a house is definitely the first step in, in securing um, uh, your independence, but then also just supporting people with day to day and helping them secure that housing and, and readjust to, to that kind of life or just connecting them with any kind of external supports that they need is really the other piece to, to um, deeply affordable but supportive housing. And that's really, you know, the more we have that in the city, I think that'll really help, um, you know, decrease the homeless population. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Hania, did you want to add anything before I move on? Sorry, I was muted. Um, no, just again that, you know, in a city like Toronto where um, things are very expensive, you know, even for people like us who are, you know, young professionals, uh, people like yourselves who are students who are probably working part-time jobs as well. Um, you know, if we find it difficult, then someone living with a mental health or addiction issue who has spent five, six years in a shelter, um, it's almost impossible, right? So it's really about creating this network of supports where you've got deeply affordable housing, where you have community support services, where maybe you have someone checking in on you once a week um, that really need to come together to make sure that people get housing, but also that people stay in housing long term and they, they just don't go through this you know, endless cycle of housing, shelter, housing, shelter. Definitely. This conversation about support is definitely very, very impactful. Um, we're going to move to the topic about donations. And again, this question that I have here is for Homes First. Homes First's fundraising events, so for example, Homes for Dinner and other third party events, have been instrumental in bringing awareness to the issue of homelessness and raising needed funds from donors. In a post COVID 19 environment, what steps is Homes First taking to maintain this level of commitment from its donors? And how have you modified your events to continue engaging the public and to raise money? Yeah, so Homes First was going through a very interesting transition period with our fundraising team. And just as we were kind of settling into our new way of working, COVID hit. Um, and with, you know, operating as many shelters as we do, the safety of our clients and our staff came foremost. So, um, you know, other things kind of took to the back burner. Um, we're really lucky right now to have a really great team and a really great network of donors and friends who have been continuing to support us. Um, so for example, Ryan and his team have been working endlessly since the start of the pandemic to get PPE donations and we've been super fortunate to receive um, so, you know, some of that to, to keep our clients and our staff safe. We are getting monetary donations through our website. Um, like I mentioned before, we get food donations, drop off to the shelters and, and other sites. Um, so, you know, we're really grateful for that. In the post COVID-19 world, I mean, it's hard to imagine what our events will look like because we just don't know how long COVID-19 is gonna last, right? Um, we're in the middle of a second wave right now. There could be a third, there could be a fourth. We just don't know what the next six to eight months look like and fundraising planning sometimes takes that long. Um, so in the meantime, you know, we're just doing our best to stay connected to our followers, to, to speak out and reach out to other groups of people, um, such as students like yourself, to let them know what we're doing there. Um, you know, follow us on social media um, if you wanna stay updated on what we're doing. Um, and one thing that you can do right now if you really want to support us um, is either go online to make a monetary donation. Um, and something new that we're trying is um, uh, accepting digital Walmart gift cards. So Walmart gift cards are really great for us because it allows, you know, if we give a $20 gift card to our resident, it allows them to go to one place um, and get whatever they need. Um, so, you know, helps them stay safe because they don't have to go to multiple stores, uh, but also just provides them a little boost of monetary support. Um, so these gift cards, you know, we're either going to give them directly to residents or we're going to use them to buy things for Christmas because it's October already and Christmas is just around the corner. Um, so if anyone does want to, you know, support us that way, I would say you can buy a gift card and um, send it to donate at homesfirst.on.ca. Um, and if you send us the receipt that you get with it, we can send you a tax receipt um, or you can um, make a donation online. Um, and we're a great organization uh, where if you check out our funds, um, you know, a lot of our money goes straight into programming to support our clients directly. Thank you so much. And we'll definitely be sure to share that out for you guys as well afterwards. And now I have a question for Nicole from Covenant House. 
Research has shown that public, private, and nonprofit collaboration is essential to address social issues in communities. In October 2020, uh, Nordstrom Department Stores announced it will partner with Covenant House Toronto as a part of a new North American campaign aimed at supporting youth experiencing homelessness through its Treasure and Bond brand. Uh, what are the outcomes Covenant House hopes to achieve through this unique partnership? Yeah, so we were super excited um, to work with Nordstrom and to hear they are actually supporting five charities and we're, we are super honored to be picked. And as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, we're almost 80% donor funded. So our corporate support and our individual donors and our event donations are all super important. And through the support of organizations like Nordstrom, we're able to continue to work with our homeless traffic and at-risk youth. And really, the partnership just allows us to grow our programming and to deliver life-changing programs to the more than 300 youth we support a day. Great. Thank you so much. That is a great partnership. And one more question for Homes First before we head on to our audience Q&A. So, what are some of the largest issues that need to be addressed in order to break the cycle of homelessness? So for Homes First, for example, you guys have a program called Follow Up Supports. Uh, would you mind explaining the intention of this program and how it benefits both homeless individuals and the City of Toronto? Um, Ryan, if you want to do issues and then I'll do Follow Up Supports. No problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, this is a very, very complex uh, question. Of course, I mean, homelessness really is rooted in a lot of isms that I, I won't get into right now, but um, you know, there's, there's a, a, a whole range of reasons why um, you know, somebody could be dealing with lack of housing. But when you get to the core of it, it's really the need for more deeply affordable housing that I think would be the, the best solution. Um, when we say that, we don't mean housing that's 80% of market rent um, because that's still close to 2000. We mean housing that's um, that those living on Ontario Works and ODSP, uh, our Ontario Disability Support Program, uh, stuff that they can afford. So uh, housing that's deeply affordable, that has partnerships and programs to support those living with mental health and addiction issues, something that's low barrier. Uh, so if somebody is struggling or they might lose their housing, their supports to sort of get them back and maintain it rather than lose their housing and then just reach, go back into the shelter system and start that vicious cycle of homelessness uh, uh, over again. So uh, one, you know, one's big, big reason, but uh, there's, there's so many different contributing factors really. And, and what our follow-up supports team um, does is really, you know, they work to break that cycle. So finding housing is the first step. It's really difficult. You got it. And then you have to maintain it. And um, that can be really difficult. Maybe you don't know how to budget and, you know, you spent all your money on something and now you don't have enough rent, uh, for, the, for the rent the next month. Or uh, maybe you have no cooking skills. I have no cooking skills. So if you're living on your own, um, feeding yourself is really difficult, right? And if you can't feed yourself, maybe you're going to go panhandle or maybe you're going to steal, um, you know, just whatever you can because you're hungry and you need to feed yourself. So our follow-up supports team, you know, works with clients to ensure that they have what we call the life skills to maintain their housing. It can be everything from cooking to cleaning to budgeting to knowing, um, you know, where your doctor is and how to get supports that way so that, you know, they're not drawn back, you know, because you can become institutionalized in the shelter, right? You can become just like, you know, people do in the, in the justice system. You can get used to, you know, the comfort of having a three meals a day in a bed, you know, ready for you. So, you know, if you can provide these people, um, and, and, you know, they found housing, if you can provide people the life skills that they need to maintain the housing, then you can also break the cycle of homelessness. And thank you so much. And thank you all so much for participating with me in that wonderful, wonderful discussion. All that information was completely insightful and amazing. And thank you for sharing your knowledge and your resources with us. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, I'm going to move us into the audience question and answer period right now. And Francis and Brianna will be hosting that portion of the evening. And again, you'll be able to either raise your hand and come on your camera or just turn on your mic and ask, ask your question to either organization. Or if you'd like to, you can type it in the chat and uh, one of them will read it out for you. So thank you again. And uh, there is now... Yep, go ahead, everyone. You can ask your question. Sorry, I thought I saw one in there.
So we have a question from Sarah. I just wanted to say thank you to both organizations for speaking tonight and offering your insight on homelessness in Toronto. My question is, how is each organization contributing to environmental sustainability while tackling the homelessness crisis within the greater Toronto area? That's a really good question. I don't think I've ever considered that angle. That is a great well, question. I would agree. Um, sorry, Ryan, you can go. No, that's okay. I was going to say, unfortunately, environmental sustainability isn't a huge focus with us right now, but I know we've been looking into different grants and funding because there is a lot of avenues lately for funding for people that do want to contribute some way to environmental sustainability. Um, so, you know, we've looked at things like green roofs and uh, building on garden spaces. We do have a garden program that's pretty uh, well attended at, at one of our, our housing locations in the downtown area. Um, you know, so doing, you know, a lot of outdoor activities around landscaping and gardening and things like that um, with, with volunteer groups is something that we do a lot of. Um, but, you know, that, I don't know if maybe there's, there's other things, honey, that I'm missing. That we I'll jump do. in and just say that um, we are partnered with Second Harvest who do a lot in the city of Toronto to tackle food waste. Um, and, you know, that's food that, you know, if they didn't collect that it would end up in, in landfills and garbages and then you know, by collecting it, they're actually supporting people who, um, you know, are facing food insecurity. Um, so, you know, Second Harvest is a really great organization. We're really lucky to have them. And I, I think our staff from, from them last year was like just, you know, our partnership with them. We saved, I think, 30,000 pounds of food from going into the landfills, which was really great. We've also partnered with one organization called uh, Road to Zero Waste. We've done two workshops with them. They just talk about food sustainability, but also demything uh, like myths about um, expiration dates and how to preserve food. And it's a kind of an interactive workshop uh, where there's smoothies at the end. And they also have community fridges where they collect um, food from different um, from different restaurants and grocery stores and make sure that we're reducing waste uh, and they can be accessible to anyone in the public and they're just set up and Homes First was right in the process of setting up our own community fridge um, and just you know when when COVID-19 happened you know, it kind of affected some of our volunteer commitments so we, 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 we haven't been able to set up the delivery yet but we still are partnering with them and we still do workshops with them as well so just a little shout out to Road to Zero Waste. That's super cool. I've never even heard of that program. That sounds interesting. Um, so Cabinet House, I unfortunately, I don't work in um, our programs. I work alongside our program staff, um, just, you know, learning about what it is we're implementing and what our youth are doing. So I'm not sure I can answer this question completely, but I do know that we are, we try and be as environmentally cautious and aware as we can. And we really like to try and, you know, as everyone go paper free and not print as much and all those sorts of things. But I also know we, we do have a rooftop garden and that's a really great program for our youth um, to participate in gardening. And it also allows sometimes youth to get that, you know, you know, taste of nature in the middle of downtown Toronto. And we have a program called Cooking for Life which is one of the few uh, government funded programs we have. And it is based off of a George Brown condensed culinary arts program, but our Cooking for Life program actually, um, they use the vegetables and fruits that we grow in the rooftop garden, as well as our main kitchen. So um, that's a lot of fun. And I think it, it not only, um, helps the environment, but it's also giving our youth another skill that they can add and maybe a new hobby that they'll really enjoy as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, we do have a few more questions in the chat. And so the next question is from Micah and it is, what other policy changes are you pushing for governmentally? The current system can be argued to actually keep people stuck in the system due to a number of factors like insufficient social assistance, and then in brackets, OW, ODFP, or social stigmas surrounding poverty and homelessness. Are your organizations in support of the concept of universal basic income? And if so, how should it support marginalized groups differently than the rest of the population? 
Yeah, that's a pretty complex question. Um, you know, we work really closely with the city of Toronto to, to do what we do. Um, and we're, we're fortunate to have their support, but we also understand that, um, you know, we, there's always a push for more. So we're always, you know, working with the city to push for more, um, you know, affordable housing, very um, supportive housing. Um, you know, we have a building called Strawn House, which is extremely unique in the city and supports really the hardest to house. Um, and we've been told that we need, you know, 10 other Strawn Houses across the city because um, the need is that high. Um, so, you know, that's a, it's a question I don't think we really have the answer to, but if I was to speak, um, you know, just kind of on what I've seen uh, about our organization, um, you know, we're really just pushing um, for more supportive housing for, for everybody, um, whether you are, have really high need supports or maybe if you're on the lower end in terms of how many supports you need, because we've seen what it can do. Um, you know, we have clients who live at Strawn who came into this, uh, t came in to start living there, you know, after years on the streets. Um, and, you know, you know, they were doctors, you know, they finally got a doctor's appointment after five years. And the doctor was like, you know, they probably have three years to live based on their health. And they've lived 18 years and they've moved out of Strawn and they've stabilized their lives completely and they're back in touch with their family. Um, and they're, you know, living independent lives, um, totally, you know, supporting themselves um, and coming to us if they do need support time to time. So we definitely do see the impact of supportive housing. Um, and, and that's why we've been operating kind of on that model for 35 years. And the more that we can push for supportive, deeply affordable housing, um, I think the better we will be off um, as, a, as a city as a whole. Yeah, and I think that um, absolutely, we totally agree and affordable housing is, is what we need and what a lot of organizations are pushing for, but also, um, when you're housing uh, homeless people, and for us, our homeless young people, if we house them and we're not giving them the skills to keep their housing, then they will be back in the system. So I think that's another thing that we really try and work with our young people is we want to make sure when we house you, you're going to be able to keep that housing so you're not stuck in the system. So giving you um, those skills like budgeting or cooking or those uh, financial literacy and how to keep your job and those sorts of things are going to help in the long run of keeping that housing. Perfect. Our next question is from Jenna. She asks, Canada has been facing a major spike in opioid overdoses since the onset of the pandemic, with the highest number of deaths ever recorded this year. Social distancing has definitely impacted harm reduction strategies, such as safe consumption sites and support services. How do you think we can address, address this issue in general or with respect to your organizations? Ryan, do you wanna go um, ahead? Sure, uh, that, is a, that is a great question. Um, so I, I, we, we get harm reduction updates and we work with different harm reduction agencies in the city of Toronto. And it's just opening up that dialogue and continuing communication and education around what we can do to be safe, but also respond, um, you know, uh, shelter, community shelter workers and social service workers have a responsibility to respond to those emergency situations if needed. Um, but yes, it definitely impacts, you know, there's different methods and different ways of, of protecting yourself that are being developed. Um, but it, it's a tough question. Um, you know, we, again, we, we continue to just push forward like we have and just try and educate ourselves as best we can and work closely with Toronto Public Health and, and work with medical professionals as well to get up-to-date information and you know we get updates um, multiple times a day from from a bunch of different agencies uh, around that exact question so it's a it's a work in progress. And I know in our shelter systems because um, again so it's basically one person per room in the in the hotel program so you know we've um, staff there are constantly checking on clients um, to see that if they're okay and if we know a client is a user um, you know we really try to make sure that there's um, dialogue within the staff um, to make sure that you know has someone seen them today is he doing okay let's go check on him and also having an open communication with the client who is using so that they know that um, if they have a problem or you know they you know if it's a matter of um, 
you know, they want to use maybe um, with someone or just, you know, have someone there while they use just in case. Um, it's really about building a relationship with the client so that they know that they are supported and that they feel safe. Um, and that obviously that their health is uh, the most important thing. Yeah. And I think Covenant House would echo that as well. And we've been working really hard while we are a dry facility. So um, they're not allowed to bring drugs and alcohol onto the premises. Our youth do know that we are a safe space and that if they, they will not be turned away if they're coming to us high, because we want them to know that uh, as mentioned that this is a mental illness and you're, you're dealing with something really hard and we rather you come down from that high in a safe space than feel like you can't come home at all. So it's again, as Hanya said, maintaining that open dialogue and making sure that they know they have support at the shelter. Yeah, that's all. I mean, it seems like you guys all do a really great job of destigmatizing the issue and just making the matter at hand, like getting matter at hand, getting the person into a safe space and making sure that they aren't turned away. Um, so that's really awesome. We have another question in the chat. This one is from Elizabeth. And she said, hi everyone, thank you to all, um, both the organizations and Students for Shelters for this evening. I know this was touched upon briefly, but what are some misconceptions about the demographic of folks using your support? Also, how can we combat stereotypes about these misconceptions? Um, yeah, so for Homes First, we kind of focus on older um, adults who um, are you know living with a mental health or addiction issue um, and I think the a lot of the times people kind of think that oh if you're using a substance you've chosen this path um, or you know if you have a mental health condition um, like maybe you know they shouldn't maybe they shouldn't be here maybe they're a danger to the public maybe they should be institutionalized um, we have such a diverse group of people living with us I um, you know, we've had a college professor living with us. We have a engineer living with us. Um, uh, I knew I knew a resident who was a nurse. I knew a resident who was an artist, um, writers, um, scientists, anything and everything in between that you can think of. Um, they've probably come through our doors. So it, it's really this understanding that a mental health uh, or a mental health or addiction issue can, you know, affect anybody, no matter kind of where you come from. Yes, most of our clients, um, you know, have a history of trauma and that trauma starts in their childhood and their youth. Um, but that being said, um, you know, life can change in a second. COVID has sh certainly shown us that. Um, so there are, you know, you, we really can't say that there's one type of homeless individual um, because we could easily be that person in three weeks or three months. I think another misconception too is, um, you know, that homeless people that live in the shelter system don't, that they don't work and they don't have jobs. Uh, so um, at every one of our shelters, we have residents who live there who have jobs um, and, and work on, you know, Monday to Friday or work a weekend and work part-time or whatever. Um, and there's also this misconception I hear a lot where if you have a mental health challenge, you know, you're not capable of um, uh, holding yourself accountable or taking care of yourself or being able to properly integrate into society. It's just, you know, completely false. Obviously, there are different ranges of, of challenges that people can have. But, you know, with supports, you know, you, you should be able to have the same, you know, uh, the same access to services and to occupations that anybody else can have. So, um, you know, the misconception that because uh, their mental health challenge, they can't be reintegrated into society is, is one I hear, unfortunately. Um, but so that's another one on top of that. And Sorry, if I'll just chime back in. There's also this idea that people who are experiencing homelessness don't contribute to society. And like, that's completely false. We have residents who volunteer. We have residents who, um, you know, really care for the community that they live in. And at one of our sites, um, we have a group of residents who routinely, and I mean like twice or three times a week, go and pick up needles from the park. Um, and it's not, tech, you know, they're not all needles that those clients have specifically been using, but it could be like, you know, the other respite down the street, their residents were using the park and left a bunch of needles. But our residents understand that, um, you know, this might be a temporary home for them, but it's still a home and they want to take care of that. And they want to take care of their, their neighbors and the communities around them. Um, so they actively engage um, and try to make positive impact wherever they can. And we do that at all of our sites. We try to make positive impacts at every site that we go to or, you know, every neighborhood that we're in because we understand that 
people have these misconceptions and they don't want shelters in their backyards. But, you know, um, people using shelters aren't bad people and, and they want to be part of communities and neighborhoods just as much as the, the rest of us do. I think um, speaking from uh, the Covenant House youth perspective, we are working with 16 to 24 year olds and the demographic we're serving are homeless trafficked and at risk. So a homeless individual could be very, their living situation and their appearance could be very different than a youth who's at risk or trafficked. And so I think for us, a lot of the time we, we have, we have, and we offer, because again, we offer such a wide range of services people forget that not all of our youth are going to be homeless. Some of them are just couch surfing and they're just a step away from being homeless. Others maybe are in that at risk position and Covenant House is what I find interesting is that our services are available to anyone between the ages of 16 to 24. And so because we are a shelter and we're working with the, the vulnerable demographic, somebody who's you know well off and maybe not as um, traumatized in their life, probably wouldn't seek Covenant House out for their services, but maybe someone who, you know, only it comes from a one parent household and they have three younger siblings and they have to help, they have three jobs because they have to help pay for rent. So they're not able to go to school, they might use their services. So sometimes there's a little bit of a mis misconception that everyone at Covenant House is homeless and that might not be the case for us. And then kind of, Adding to that, our youth don't often look homeless. And I think that confuses a lot of people because, you know, you're homeless, so you must smell bad and you must be dirty and you might not, must not have nice clothes. But I think that a lot of shelters are really fortunate because they get a lot of really wonderful donors. And I know that we have so many great donors, um, both corporate and individuals. So for example, Roots donated 100 backpacks to us last year. We had an individual donate, donor give us a Canada Goose jacket. So if you see an 18-year-old with a Canada Goose jacket, you're thinking that person's not homeless, when that's not necessarily the case. And also sometimes they'll see our youth with iPhones or um, Samsungs or, or smartphones, and they think, well, how, how can somebody who's homeless have that? Well, our youth, our, our young people are 16 to 24, and they might get you know, a check from the government and they don't have those budgeting skills or they don't realize that they might need that money for food later on because maybe they have a couch to stay to, tonight, but they don't know that next week they won't. So because they don't have that foresight, they might use that money that they got to buy that new iPhone to fit in because they're still in high school and they just want to have friends. And they want to be able to talk to friends. And just because they have that phone doesn't necessarily mean they have a plan or data. They could just everywhere has Wi-Fi, so they could just be using the Wi-Fi. So I think that's another common misconception is that like, if you don't smell bad or have dirty clothes, you're not homeless and therefore you don't need my help. And I think that's something that we really, we need to approach our community and, um, the people that we see with a lot of empathy and that we don't know what these people are going through. Thank you very much to all three of you for that answer. That was very interesting. And I think this is a conversation we definitely need to have with the broader society. And I'm glad you guys are bringing this up with the U of T community. So our next question is from Ezra who says, hi, and thank you to the organizations present here tonight. My question is regarding domestic violence and abuse within the home leading to homelessness. Do your organizations work with any external agencies when navigating such situations, like reconnecting family members, custody, et cetera? Or is that, done, or is that work done internally within the organization? And if so, what is normally the primary goal when going about resolving these situations as complex as they can be? Um, so Homes First, uh, before the pandemic, had two um, women-only shelters um, for anyone who identified as a woman. It didn't have to biologically be a woman. Um, and so we did have cases where um, residents would be, um, 
you know, fleeing situations of domestic abuse, who may have lost their children, um, you know, a, a whole, you know, set of different things. Uh, so we're really lucky because, um, you know, we've been operating for so long to have really great partnerships in the various communities that we're located in to support our residents um, if they are going through this. Um, I'm not a frontline worker, so I don't know exactly what these partnerships are and who these external agencies are, but I can say that um, we work, um, you know, any kind of support that our residents need um, at that time that you know they're in our shelter um, we do our best to to get those supports for them and all of our um, uh, community service workers and community shelter workers and social service workers are all trained in trauma-informed care and things like that so they are able to provide that support when needed and um, like Hanya said you know if sometimes in emergency situations we have to refer somebody um, to another shelter or maybe a more discreet shelter and change locations and we work closely with other shelters in the area as well. Um, so yeah um, and again if we need to and facilitate a conversation with social services or, or that sort of thing I mean I know uh, intensive case management workers do that regularly so. Um, yeah I think that's a that's a great question Ezra. So we uh, again just going off of the last thing I said about a lot of our youth not looking homeless. So actually a lot of our youth, uh, I think it's about 61% of our youth are coming from middle to upper income families. And a large reason that they are homeless or they find themselves living in a precarious living situation is because of abuse and neglect. So, um, and 63% and of our youth are fleeing abuse and neglect. So um, it's something that's definitely happening and that a lot of our young people are dealing with and experiencing, unfortunately. Uh, but we do have um, programs and partnerships and organizations and staff that are trained to deal with that. And um, be, again, we're working with 16 to 24 year olds, but if we do uh, receive anyone under that age and it is a situation of neglect or abuse, or they're just homeless and under the age of 16, we refer them to Children's Aid Society. So um, we work with Children's Aid fairly closely. And then we also have a program called Family and Natural Supports, the Family and Natural Supports Program. And that's a really neat program because we, are, we realize that as a young person, one of the best ways to prevent homelessness is to, to keep those bonds with a trusted adult. And so we would never ever put a young person back into a situation in which they're um, being abused or neglected. But if there is an adult in their life, whether that's their parents or maybe an aunt or um, a pastor or a coach or some sort of caring adult in their life that they're able to connect with, that they would like to connect with, we can work with them in that family and natural supports program to reconnect them with that um, family member or that adult. And sometimes it could be to live with, to, to put them back into their home, or it could just be something like um, we had a youth who he was estranged from his family, but his uncle invited him to his wedding and he really wanted to go, but he didn't know how because he hadn't spoken to his family. So they're also there to support them through that process. And I think last year, um, or yeah, so in 2019, uh, we saw 204 families or um, support networks that youth were reconnected with. Well, thank you so much um, to all of you for your response on that. It definitely emphasized um, how important having a supportive network is for helping all these individuals. We have another question from Micah, and it is, what are some strategies that community organizations like your own are using to combat the forces of gentrification in the downtown core? What does this mean for access to support for your clients? Um, so a lot of our Homes First residences have been around for quite some time. And so as things change in the community around us, um, you know, because we are an RGI model, um, it doesn't really affect our clients in terms of housing prices. But of course, you know, if the Fresh Go closes down and they open like a Whole Foods, like that's, you know, um, that's a difficult transition because you know the prices are very different that's it, it's not something our clients could realistically afford that being said we do open shelters um in areas that you know are pretty established sometimes and we do get 
either sometimes, you know, people are really excited to have us and support us, or we get a lot of pushback. Um, and Ryan can speak more to that, but, you know, we really do our best um, wherever our housing or our, or our shelter properties are to um, get to know the community, to get to know their concerns and work with them to create positive mm -hmm. impacts in that community because we understand that it's important, you know, um, you know, we're, it's, we're changing the community slightly, we're bringing new people in, um, but also it's very important for us and our residents to feel a part of a community. Um, you know, uh, the feeling of home is really, you know, feeling like you're part of something and feeling like you belong. Um, and we try to, to, to promote that wherever we go. Just to build on that, um, Hanya touched it on it a little bit. Part of what Homes First does, um, usually with most of our shelters, when we open up a, a shelter in the community, is there's a whole about six month process leading up to it where we engage with stakeholders in the community, connect with the counselor's office, connect with the local MP, with the police division, local schools and businesses in the immediate area, um, faith groups, churches, things like that, just to um, introduce ourselves and just open up that dialogue and those uh, means of communication. And then we sort of establish what we call community liaison committees, where you know we meet on a monthly, sometimes more than that um, basis to discuss community issues. A lot of it is around the shelter and residents and challenges that are um, you know faced with that, but a lot of it, it can also be about building building partnerships and building that sense of community and, and building the community in the direction that everybody wants and just, um, you know, continuing that conversation about what the community means to them, what it looks like to them, what changes, and just getting the right people there to, to get that dialogue and to get people's voices heard. Uh, at the end of the day, people really want an avenue to express their opinions and to uh, create change. And part of these meetings and part of what we do when we engage with the community is to do just that. So, you know, we try. Yeah, I think very similarly at Covenant House as well. Like I'm not a program staff and I'm not working in housing, so I can't speak uh, too well to it. But I do know that in order to help with things like this, we do have um, youth in transition workers. And kind of like Ryan said, we're always building partnerships and relationships within the community. And we work with um, landlords to help house our youth and to help them feel confident in their tenants. And one of the ways we do that is through our youth and transition workers. And so when we do house people in the community, uh, our young people always have their youth and transition worker. And this is just kind of to help that young person keep their housing and should any issues arise, rather than uh, a landlord saying like, well, okay, well, they haven't paid rent this month or uh, for the past couple months, I'm going to kick them out. They can approach their youth and transition worker and say like, listen, this is what's happening. What's going on. And then the youth and transition worker can approach the youth so that we can work with the issue before it gets to the point of them losing their housing. Um, that's really interesting. And there is another question in the chat that touches on housing. And then I actually have a question as well. Um, that I think I'm going to ask before that one, because it does expand on this. It's just, you have all thrown around some numbers with regards to, um, for example, income. I think it was Ryan and he said that for income, you try to spend no more than 30% of income on housing. And so to me, I'm just kind of wondering how like exactly the housing system works. Do you have some houses that are um, funded or I guess like paid for by your organization and then houses that you, as Nicole, you just mentioned that you partner with landlords in order to get a good deal um, and then build up trust, which builds confidence in people who are using this housing. Is, is that kind of the transition into how it works or? Uh, so Ryan and I aren't on the finance teams and like it's a really complicated calculation on how it works. Um, so in total Homes First owns 13 housing properties. So we either own the buildings or we manage the buildings um, with on behalf of the city essentially. And so um, uh, everyone's income is different. So everyone's rent is actually calculated based on their income. So, um, you know, Residents, it's not like uh, all the residents in one building are paying like, you know, $100 a month and everyone else in this building on the West End is paying $150. Um, it really depends on the resident and if the resident's working or if they have changed, like if they go from ODSP, they turn 65 and then they get a pension, like, you know, that might fluctuate what their rent is. So there are a lot of like 
math and calculations um, that kind of, you know, play into it. But also we really, um, you know, we follow really closely like the RGI guidelines that are set out, I believe, by the city um, to make sure that we are kind of um, doing it the, the way that we're supposed to. Um, in terms of people moving into housing that is not our own, um, I know that um, you can apply for subsidies and, and grants and, and other things um, if you're moving out of the shelter system into um, just no market rent housing to, to help you um, uh, you know, get housing. So maybe they'll provide you first and last, um, or maybe um, you know the the landlords are willing to accept a subsidy from the government. Um, it, it's we have specialized housing um, workers on site that kind of do this. Um, a lot of the times that we find that you know sometimes the money isn't the issue, but landlords don't want to rent to someone with a mental health issue, right? So there are a bunch of different factors that go into it, uh, but it is very mathy and that's just unfortunately not our strong suit. And yeah, just to expand on the shelter side, you know, there are some buildings that we own and operate, but then there's also buildings, yeah, that the city um, is either leasing from an owner. So an example would be our, our Delta and our Strathcona hotels. The city is leasing that property temporarily in response to COVID-19 and we're just the, sh the shelter operators that, um, you know, are funded by the city to, to provide those supports. So there's different ways, you know, we don't, we don't own all of our buildings, uh, but some of our shelters we do. And then, um, yeah, like Hanya said, in terms of like housing, it all depends on people's income. Yeah, we would echo similar things. And we at Covenant House also, so our hotel program is also funded by the city of Toronto right now. Um, we have, and it, it also depends on the, similar to Homes First, on the individual, on their income, those sorts of things. We also do have some donors though that will donate towards our apartment programs or our community housing, um, just to help subsidize some of their rent. And I think that, and again, I, I don't know because I'm not working firsthand with our young people, but I think that's something that's also set out with their youth worker about when they're ready to transition to independence, what their rent's gonna look like, what's affordable, what they're being paid, um, at work. So there's a lot of factors that go into, you know, subsidized housing and rent and um, independent living. And just a follow-up question to what Francis asked. Um, Homes First, you guys mentioned that you guys charge rent based on the individual. So is, are there people subsidizing the difference? Because I'm sure there's like a certain maintenance fee that is needed. So I think the subsidies actually come from the government, um, whether it be the city of Toronto or provincial government, I'm not sure, um, but there are definitely some subsidies in place um, to allow that to happen. Cause uh, like we have some clients come in to pay rent and like sometimes someone's paying like, you know, $142 for the month. So like, depending on the, where the location is, obviously the market rent is a lot higher and market rent is basically what you and I would pay without, you know, kind of government support. Um, so it really, there are subsidies in place. Um, it's just, we don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. I'm not, I'm a journalism grad, you guys. I don't do numbers, sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. So on to our final question for the night so far. First of all, thank you to everyone, to both organizations. For Homes First, I know housing in Toronto can be extremely expensive. Out of curiosity, how much does affordable housing cost per month? And what are some other factors beside cost that are considered when looking for suitable locations? Um, yeah, I can touch on that quickly. And also just to expand a little bit on the previous question, HomeSource also has uh, a property management team and, and we have contractors and people from um, that department who can deal with any kind of like, yeah, property stuff, damage, fixing, repairs, any kind of stuff like that. So that's also included in some of the services that we provide. But in terms of yeah, how it breaks down and subsidies and fees, I don't really know. But um, uh, to, to, to expand on, on the next question, um, Sorry, I'm, 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 I've, oh, so part of what, what goes into determining where people go is, you know, around accessibility, around the supports that they needed, around their demographic. Um, you know, we have some buildings that are, you know, really focused for single men, uh, and then we have others that are more focused on families. Uh, so it really, it, it depends on what their situation is, what their living situation, what their demographic, and what their challenges are, but we try our best to kind of, um, you know, if, if our building's not accessible, and we have somebody with mobility challenges, then of course, we'll, we'll have to change our building, and uh, things like that, and if, you know, um, you know, if it's not in close proximity to certain social services that they need in the community, then we, you know, that's another factor as well. So. 
Yeah, those are similar factors that we're considering and working again, our young people are working with their youth workers. So uh, if our young person already has a job downtown Toronto or maybe is going to school downtown Toronto, we might not be looking at uh, landlords in the West End for them because that might be a little bit too difficult. Um, and things like Ryan mentioned, so other social services they might need. Um, sometimes we have youth and they are, um, their faith is really important to them. So they want to be close to a synagogue or, or a mosque or a church or something of the sort. So it, there's a lot of, I think any factors that you yourself would consider in a neighborhood, we're also considering for our clients. And because we want them, um, as Hanya mentioned earlier, like these are their homes and we want them to feel um, like they're going to a place of community. So just, the, I would I would say almost the same things that you might think of when you want to um, rent somewhere or live somewhere. That's what we're considering for our youth as well. Mm -hmm. And just quickly, the, the term affordable housing. So when we say market rent, we mean like, you know, just you go on like Kijiji and you're looking for an apartment and it's like $800 for a bedroom out like by like Kennedy Station or whatever it is, right? And then so affordable housing would then be considered 80% of market rent. Um, but, you know, if market rent in the downtown core is like, yeah, 2200 or something for a, a bachelor or a single bedroom, which is what most people want. Most people want their own space. 80% um, of, you know, 2000 is a lot. It's math I can't do in my head, but it's a lot. Um, so when we talk about affordable housing, we say the word deeply affordable housing, um, housing that people on um, Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Support Program, which are essentially, you know, so uh, welfare programs, um, you know, housing that people can afford because you know you and I can't afford you know two thousand dollars a month um, working nine to five every you know five days a week so we can't imagine you know someone who's on a disability program to afford that um, so consider like if you and I are you know one or two paychecks away from being homeless because our, our place is so expensive um, just imagine how how much you know how difficult it is for anyone else who probably only makes a couple hundred dollars a month perfect and our next question is from Elizabeth Francis you want to read that one yes I can I turned my mic on and then I saw yours go on clicked it off quickly but I got this um, so the question from Elizabeth is both organizations spoke of their various support programs to help people get on their feet. If possible, how can your organizations tackle the roots of certain causes of homelessness? Are there any prevention measures that can be taken? Yeah, I can, I can jump on that one to start, especially because uh, we are working with the younger demographics. So we're, we're working definitely on prevention. That's a big one um, because often the longer you are homeless, uh, the more likely you are to stay in this cycle of homelessness. Um, so if we can stop it while people are young or get to, to young people and explain to them about homelessness, uh, we find that that can be an effective uh, method to use. So what I say, um, you know, talking to young people about homelessness. So one I mentioned uh, earlier tonight about our prevention programs in schools. And I think a lot, we are based out of Toronto and we um, service a lot of young people in Toronto in the GTA, but we kind of consider ourselves um, a national organization, but also international because we do get refugees. But looking uh, at, at a Canada basis, a lot of our young people or a number of our young people are coming from small towns. And there's this idea that if they are fleeing a bad situation or maybe they feel misunderstood or maybe they're being rejected because their parents don't accept their sexuality, whatever it may be, that, oh, I can leave maybe they're from Timmins. You know, I'm gonna leave Timmins, which is a relatively small community, and I'm gonna go to Toronto and life's gonna be better because I'll be accepted there not knowing that if you don't have a support network in Toronto, the cost of living is way too high. The likeliness of you finding a job is also very slim if you're coming with no support. Where are you gonna to go to school? There's all these things that they might not consider because they're probably fighting for their survival. So one of the 
ways that we're working on this is through those school presentations and talking about runaway prevention. And for a while there was, I, it's interesting, but like a glamorization of homelessness of, you know, you're 17 and you do whatever you want and you have no rules and no parents. And so it's also breaking down that, that it's not glamorous and that there's a lot of, you know, scary realities out there if you are young and you're homeless. And so we really think when you can get to young people when they are teenagers and explain to them the realities of what could be, it's a way to, for them to get informed, but also if they are experiencing abuse or something of the sort, they're able to learn about the reality of homelessness or precarious living. And then maybe we can, if they had come to us, we can give them supports in the community um, or we can refer them to agencies that can help them out of their situation without them having to be homeless. And I think that's another reason that we are also working, we're working with at-risk youth because we don't want them to be homeless. So we realized that if we were working with 16 to 24 year olds and we said only homeless people can use our services, we are then um, part of the problem because there's a whole group of people that are on the brink of homelessness or that could be homeless. And so if we don't, you know, help them find jobs or help them with skills that they too are a step away from homelessness. And then uh, I'll also reference again, our family and natural supports program. And that's a program that was designed to prevent homelessness. And again, if there is a support network or a family that is able to help you and give you a living situation or refer you to the proper resources in the community, then the chances of you having to live on the streets or live couch to couch, will, we're hoping and we've seen through the success um, will reduce your chances of becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky enough to attend the Canadian Alliance and Homelessness Conference last year in Edmonton and someone there mentioned um, or did a keynote speech about tackling issues downstream. So at Homes First, we, you know, service a lot of adults who have experienced homelessness for many years. And a lot of um, the challenges that they face um, stem from trauma that they, they faced in their youth. And so, you know, the keynote speech was really about addressing things downstream, getting to those, um, you know, maybe it's getting to those traumas early and addressing them early and providing those supports earlier so that, you know, someone, um, rather than spending five years living on the streets, living rough before trying to transition into housing, maybe it's just a couple months, maybe it's just a year. And maybe the whole time they've, you know, had a support system trying to, to work with them into, into housing. Um, so it really is, and again, homelessness is such a complex issue. It's really hard to say that, you know, if we dealt with this certain cause or this root of, you know, homelessness that we could solve it for you know 50 percent of those experiencing homelessness it's it really is a number of factor of things um but it's i think for for homes first it's really about providing those services um or, or i guess for covenant house it's really about providing those services as early as possible and those supports as early as possible and for homes first it's about providing a a safe place so that then you can also if you're later in life you can still address those um you know concerns and traumas uh, in a place where you feel comfortable and in your in your own timeline so our next question comes from bia who asks Thank you, who says hi. Thank you for all the in-depth and enlightening answers so far. Considering all the abrupt readjustments that happened as a result of COVID-19, which programs and services offered right now do you think need most improvement? Um, so at the moment, really, um, you know, access to te technology and barriers around virtual programming are, you know, something that we want to build on, something that we definitely need to expand. Um, but just in terms of just uh, connecting people with social services, having more social services and funding and resources available to those kind of social services, um, you know, would definitely benefit us, you know, regardless if, you know, we're in a pandemic or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, access to proper PPE and, and you know, just continuing that stream of donations. We have been able, we've had uh, to unfortunately cut back on some of our donation requests and what we can and can't accept at certain buildings. So, you know, just being able to still provide the donations that we'd like to normally su supply our, our residents is a challenge. Things like, um, 
PPE, things like uh, toiletries and um, personal hygiene care items, um, clothing, warm clothing is always something, socks and underwear, uh, things like that. So just, you know, making sure that we're still able to keep up with the need, but uh, deliver in a, in a safe way. Uh, and then hopefully being able to expand on virtual programming. Um, you know, that's an initiative that we need to work on right now. Yeah, I think that we, I know, the, the immediate example that comes to mind is our drop-in center. And so that was a, a really hard change for us when COVID first hit because we actually had to close our drop-in center um, in order to figure out how we can still service these young people. Uh, the young people we see in our drop-in center are usually most are our most transient youth and they often are struggling. Um, there are youth that um, for whatever reason, whether or not uh, we have space in our shelter, they're just not ready to live with us or use our services. Um, but so we uh, we had to close it for a little bit and, and we struggled with that because we weren't able to, to, to service those immediate needs, but we were quickly able to adapt. And um, now we've reopened, we've been open for a couple of months and we're on an appointment only basis. So I think that that's a good alternative, but you know, when it's an appointment only, you're not able to serve as many youth. Um, so we're still working really hard and, and all the youth that we can serve, we're really, we're happy to serve them. Um, and then we're also able to continue to give them bag lunches and um, they have access to our food bank and clothing bank should they need it. So I know CSS, that that's required a lot of adapting as well as some of our programming kind of like Ryan mentioned, just, you know, figuring out how to make that go virtual. And that's something that um, we are working with our staff with and our young people. So for our young people in our crisis shelter or who live with us, we're able to, you know, if they have a meeting with their um, youth worker or their, we have a pastoral care or a spiritual care advisor, if he, um, he, offers he's actually was trained in MMA so sometimes he offers um, sports classes and kickboxing classes for young people and so they're able to do those uh, via zoom with him and so we're, we're just trying to figure out how we can offer those programs and some of our volunteers that maybe would come in and do a games night or an art class or something we're able to uh, hook that up via zoom or um, whatever technology uh, works best in the house and and get our young people engaged that way and making sure that they still feel like we're there for them and that we're, we're supporting them through this pandemic, whatever that looks like. Can I just say really quickly that it is so cool that your spiritual advisor teaches MMA. That is just like the best of both worlds. Yeah, he's probably like the best part. He, like everyone loves him. He's the oh best. <laughs> I'm really jealous. <laughs> One other service I think that, um, you know, I've been hearing a lot in the community that could definitely use more support and, and more resources are some of the out of the cold programs that had to be shut down because of COVID-19. Um, so, you know, usually it was just kind of like a warming center or a place to sleep where you could get a meal. Um, you know, there wasn't usually a lot of like support services involved in out of the cold programs, but that's another program that, you know, is not a homes first program. Um, a lot of the time they're run by like local faith organizations and churches in the area and things like that. Um, but that's definitely a program that could use more support that unfortunately is, is affecting um, the homeless population in the GTA right now. Sorry to bring it down from that cool MMA bit. <laughs> Gosh, Ryan, let's go. <laughs> so our next question is from Ryan who asks, how have the users involved in the harm reduction program who received valuable education about safe drug use benefit versus people who enter rehab? For example, have you seen that people are succeeding in things like securing employment or housing faster? Uh, so Homes First doesn't actually have its own rehab program. Um, if clients want to to enter a program like that, we definitely um, support them and, you know, try to find them the best fit. Um, that being said, I don't, so like things about like securing employment or getting housing, like those, there's a multitude of factors that go into that. And it's, yeah, it's not necessarily always just about drug use. And personally, I've met a, a couple of our residents who are, um, very strong users, I'll use that word, um, you know, don't want to give up their, their substance. Um, 
but you know are really high functioning um and are really good at you know managing their their substance use and their lives outside of it so it's not necessary just it's not necessary like you know if someone is using that they can't um get employment and keep employment it's it's really just about um you know teaching people to use safely as much as possible and if it's um you know something that they can manage in their lives just like you manage a, a mental health issue um if it's something that they can manage and and you know um not let it neg negatively affect the rest of their lives like you know there's no reason we're never going to tell a client to stop using that's that's not our place if they choose to then we'll support them um but that's totally up to them um and just to add to that uh, homes first is partnered with cam h uh, and, you know, although we, yeah, we, we aren't a rehab center, um, we do have a partnership where when we have rooms available at some of our housing locations, they are reserved for clients from the CAMH program. Uh, and then we work with the CAMH workers and their addictions counselors and our ICM staff to make sure that we're supporting them and that everybody's on the same page. And, you know, that when they, when they are finished the program, they're in secure housing with supports to help, you know, help them get back on their feet and, and, you know, obtain any kind of services or, or employment or something like that. But so there are those, you know, partnerships and ways that we work together with rehabilitation centers and addictions counselors as well, while still providing like a harm reduction approach that, that Homes First uh, policies uh, follow. Yeah, and similarly, I, I don't have a background in harm reduction um, and those sorts of things, so I can't speak too much to it, but as Hanya was saying, we if a young person or a client comes to us and has um, an addiction and wants to go to rehab or wants to find services, we uh, work with them to find the right service for them. We also have access through partnership. Again, we have an on-site healthcare clinic, um, and we also have a partnership with St. Michael's Hospital where um, we can connect young people to counselors and psychiatrists should they want to. We also have a partnership with Kim H and other addiction services in the community. So should young, a young person want to go to rehab or kind of work through their addiction, those are absolutely available. Thank you so much for your responses. I personally had no idea that you both were partnered with CAMH and you use them as a resource to um, help people who were struggling with addictions. So we have one last question for the evening as we are nearing 9 p.m. And this one I think is definitely going to um, expand on some of the answers you guys just provided. So thank you for your thoughtful responses to the question so far. This question is for Covenant House. I was curious, how have you had to accommodate your own internal policies as a result of COVID-19? For instance, I understand that your organization takes an abstinence-based approach regarding addiction, discharging residents found under the influence, or alternatively, changing the policies of the ROP program to allow residents to extend their stay. Since the pandemic, have you suspended any extraneous discharges to ensure housing for as many youth as possible under these circumstances? Yeah, that's a great question. So to start, I will say that Covenant House, uh, we've been around for almost 40 years. And in our inception, we were an abstinence space program. Absolutely. Um, and as time went on, we realized that's not effective because we want to be an organization in which the people coming to us feel safe and they don't feel judged and they feel that if they're struggling with something that they can come to us. So we realized, you know, telling someone, oh, you're drunk, you can't stay here for the night or you've been smoking pot or you did heroin, that's not gonna be effective in helping them in their journey and helping them deal with their trauma. And um, Ryan had said that their staff are all trained in trauma-informed care. Um, it's the same at Covenant House. We know that every client that we have, we're approaching, they're dealing with their own trauma. And so if a youth is using or they're acting out or they're being aggressive, that's not because, you know, of the youth worker, it's some trauma that they're dealing with. And um, while it can be hard, we know that there's something else that's going on here. So when it comes to substances and addiction, we've actually kind of pivoted our approach. And we've said that we are a dry facility. So a youth can't 
be inside drinking a beer or they can't be smoking a joint in the facility. However, if they're off the premises, they can engage in whatever activity it is that they would like to do. And we also realize it's legal to smoke pot now. It's legal to drink beer if you're over the age of 19 and we're servicing 16 to 24 year olds. So we know that a lot of our young people, maybe they went for drinks or maybe it's a Friday night and um, they're going out with friends. So we know that you know, they might be coming home drunk or under the influence. And so again, it's just that approach that we want them to feel safe. We want them to come home. And it's also that idea that if they are high, we don't want them to feel scared or that like they're going to be kicked out. So a youth, unless they are harmed to themselves, and, and if that's the case, we're going to refer them to the proper service, or if they're harming another uh, worker or uh, client at the house, then we need to have a conversation with them about what that looks like for, for their future at Covenant House. And if a youth is being discharged, it doesn't necessarily, there's definitely a reason and it's a last result, resort always, um, because we don't want these youth to be, to be in that precarious living situation. And we have um, individuals called community liaisons and their whole job is that if a youth feels wrongly discharged, they're able to go to that community liaison and say, this is what happened, this is my case, and then they can kind of fight their case um, and maybe that decision will be reversed. So if they're coming home high uh, or they've been using, we're a safe place for them to come down from their high. And we also have, like I said, we've partnered with um, St. Michael's, we have our on-site healthcare clinic, and we also have an on-site um, full-time mental health and substance youth uh, youth counselor. So we've really pivoted that approach and we, we want our youth to know that this is a safe place and we're still going to accept them and that uh, if, they're, if they're coming home high or if they have an addiction, they're not going to be discharged. Um, so that's something that is, is I guess, newer um, and it's not wrong. We did have an abstinence-based approach before, but that's definitely something we've moved away from. And as I mentioned, any reason if a, if a youth is discharged they can always challenge that and it's always a last result we don't want to be discharging people and depending on what it is it could be okay you just need to leave the house for a couple hours you can come back tonight or maybe you lose your bed for the night but you can come back tomorrow so and and like i said it's a last resort so if a youth is acting out or they have brought beer into their room that doesn't necessarily mean they've lost their bed. There might be stuff, though there will be steps taken before it gets to that point. Great, thank you so much for that answer. And as that was our last question, thank you so much, Ryan, Hania, and Nicole for having amazing answers and to all of our guests here for bringing some really great questions into the discussion this evening. Um, and as it is 8.59, we're going to conclude the panel for the evening. So think as a small gift of thanks and appreciation, we have raised funds to donate to each organization. These are going to be released from Eventbrite in a few days, so we'll get it to you as soon as possible. And thank you so much to those of you who donated. We appreciate your contributions greatly. Again, to the panelists and the Students for Shelters team, Thank you so much for your work. For anyone who wants to join S4S, we're gonna be posting a link in the chat momentarily. And um, we also did have a small raffle this evening from our attendees and the raffle winner was Samantha. Samantha Georgi, who we will contact by email. So thank you so much, everybody, again. It was an amazing evening. Thanks everybody. Thanks for listening and thanks for all your amazing questions. Thank you guys for coming out and have a great night. Thanks everybody. Thanks Bye. so much. Great questions, guys. Thank you everyone.